morning again. As stated, my name is Faith Thompson, and I am the Ombuds here for the town of Chapel Hill. Prior to that role, I served as the community outreach coordinator for our comprehensive 2020 plan. And that's what I'm gonna talk about mostly this morning, or at least for the 10 minutes that I've been allocated. I'm not gonna talk about the comprehensive plan itself. I'm gonna talk about the engagement that we did to get involvement in the plan. I have put at each of your tables information about the plan, a um, survey that was done by the University of North Carolina School of Government assessing the engagement that we um, involved ourselves in. And then a third piece is um, kind of a pictorial, if you will, of what Chapel Hill would look like if it was just 100 people. And the reason for those materials, I think, are kind of key. A lot of us had very grandiose ideals on uh, what engagement would look like. And like the mayor from West Sacramento, it is very messy, it is very involved, and it takes a lot of energy and work on the people involved. So one of the things that we were very clear to say is that we were looking for meaningful community engagement. It wasn't a matter of just, let me make sure, am I working right? Do I have to point it at the screen? No, probably at the Set me up. You can just do it here for okay, I'll, I'll do it here. Okay. Apologies. So, um, in 2011, 2012, the town of Chapel Hill tried something really, really big. And this was very different than what we had done before. Now it's working. Um, very similar to what Mary said, our intent was that we wanted to get our community involved but our community was gonna be a little bit more than just the people who paid taxes and who lived here. As you know from the two days that you've been here, we have a large community. So we kind of defined it in terms of people who live, work, play, and or pray here in Chapel Hill. And our wonderful mayor and super wonderful town manager said, we wanna get 10,000 people involved in this process. But they didn't really have an idea on what that looked like. That just sounded like a really good number out of 57,000 permanent residents. So they put that challenge out there, and that was one of the um, tasks that was assigned to me, is to make this happen, get 10,000 people involved in this activity. But they were very clear. We weren't just looking for an information dump. We didn't just want to put information out there. We didn't just want to send more information out there. We wanted to actually hear from the community on what this, their vision is on what this town would look like in 2020. So they were looking for meaningful engagement. They wanted to hear, they wanted to share information, and then they wanted to help frame that conversation. So through a, a lot of help of the planning department and our community leaders, and oh, we just had a bunch of staff that was involved. So it wasn't just you know three or five people. We're talking about a commitment of over 100 town employees for a period of about eight months that was just consistent. We met at high schools, we met at junior high schools, elementary schools. We had tavern talks that Megan organized back there where we went out into the bars and actually talked to people while they were drinking and got information from them. We had blogs, we had internet contact. We went to the shelter. We got information from homeless people. We talked to a lot of people and got them to come in and share their point of view with us. And as Mitch Silver said, in uh, the former uh, planning department head in Raleigh, North Carolina, we were very clear in telling them that if you say no to something, that means you're saying yes to something else. So we had to help frame that, that this was a visioning exercise, but we did have to establish some parameters. The old way of doing comprehensive planning, land use planners, you know, pretty much as someone said before, it might have been the mayor earlier this week, you know, they come up with an idea, they hire some consultants, they come in there and say, well, this is what your, your town or your community should look like, and it pretty much goes on the shelf. A lot of people don't 
refer back to it. So this big idea was it was not just going to be the same old, same old. We wanted to do something different. So we started with a community mapping process. And we have a wonderful employee by the name of Jennifer who made that happen, who went out to look and see who were our real partners in this community, our nonprofit organizations. Where were they located? What were they doing? What was the business that they were involved in? What kind of people's lives were they touching on a regular basis? This was people that we could then get information from. She also did some community mapping in terms of what locations would people have access to. Because it's very easy to say, well, yeah, we took the meetings out of town hall, but then we put them somewhere else where people couldn't find them. So we had to look to see exactly where people could have access to. And you've heard us brag about our transit system. Yes, our transit system is wonderful, but it doesn't go everywhere. So it meant that there were some people who literally had to do some carpooling, and we organized some carpooling, and we had some vans, and we had some buses, and we met people for picnics. You know, we would set up food in the park and invite people to come eat. You know, if you set out the food, they will come. But to also come and share their information and their viewpoint on ways that they wanted to see our community grow. So that new way meant it was a community visioning. As the mayor also shared with you yesterday from that article that you saw in the newspaper, everybody wasn't in agreement with it. But what that tells you is that they were engaged. Because had they not known what we were doing, how could they then object to it? So they had information. They knew what was going on. And it was presented to them. So exactly. I mean, it was definitely working. Melanie sitting in the back there is our graphic artist. Super, super person. She was very good at helping us to make pictorials of what we were doing. She has a real good sense of how adults learn. And you can throw words at them all day long. But pictures, they remember. So when we set out the map of what we wanted to do, we went to Melanie and said, OK, help us make this real. So that this is something that people could walk around with. And they could say, OK, town, this is your report card. In 2011, you're going to be doing this. You got an initiating committee that you set up. Who's on that initiating committee? And they could see that. They could go to the bog and see who those individuals were. And these were people that they grocery shopped with. These were people that they went to the grocery store with, that they went to church with, that they worked with. So it was very easy to say, hey, John, tell me what's going on with this 2020. We had buttons that said, ask me about 2020. And it was very cool. It came almost a status symbol to say who knew and who didn't know, because nobody wanted to not know what was going on. So that meant them hungry for more information. We also created these icons, again, thanks to Melanie, that we set up kind of, we had two great big, huge community meetings. And out of those two meetings, we came up with these icons. These icons are now a part of our organization. So any ideal, any decision that is made is assigned an icon. So there's continual feedback now that the, uh, the uh, audience, our community members can check in and say, hmm, facilitate getting around. That sounds like transit. How come that new light rail system is not assigned that? And it allows us to have another conversation to say, well, we thought that would be good, but we also thought that going to our gown and town collaboration. We got a double gown there, sorry. But <laughs> it goes into our gown and town collaboration also. So those icons are now helping us to frame the conversation more. So it's not just you know, blah, 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 blah. But they can see a picture and then see kind of what flows up underneath it. We've been very effective at cutting through the noise at setting realistic, obtainable goals. So that that is our consistent report card. That it's not just, we, we've made this Similar to politicians, sorry. We made this mad dash, we go into the community, we're kissing babies, we're shaking hands, and then they never see us again. Instead, we're staying in constant contact with them. Also in that packet that I gave you, you'll see what our, our newsletter is telling the community, 2020 is where we started, this is what's happening as a result. This is our implementation plan. So again, that's going out electronically, that's going out manually. We're still handing it out on the buses. We're still going over to the shelter to make sure people are getting information. Because we want community engagement to be something that happens for a long time. Hopefully we don't need 100 employees to continue to make it happen, but it's at least it's something that we know now where our portals are within our community. Because there are some natural leaders. And we know that if we call on X, in our community, they're going to get that information out. Very similar to you. You have some very natural leaders that are in your community 
that will be used for good or for bad. If you don't give them information, they'll make up their own. So better that at least you're supplying some good information so now they can be kind of an ambassador for your organization instead of a proponent. We did have some challenges, as Mark likes to say. It wasn't all, you know, tiptoe through the tulips. There were some things that we had to stop and look at. Time. It was a lot of information, a very short time to digest, and real life kept happening. You know, babies kept needing to go to the doctors, groceries still needed to be bought. Most of our meetings, we tried to fluctuate between having an evening meeting and a late afternoon meeting so that we could meet um, kind of the needs of the community in both respects. That also worked against us in terms of continuity. Every meet, well, at least every other week we were having a community meeting, some community members came to every meeting. They were faithful. They had their lunches packed. They had their questions framed. They, had, you know, they were ready to engage. And then we had some who didn't. A large percent of them didn't. 63% of them didn't. So that meant we had to continue to recap. Expectations, keeping them realistic. We set as a vision. But at the same time, it's not pie in the sky. Somebody has to pay for it. So we kept putting prices on everything that they said they wanted. Naysayers, how do we manage uncertainty? Because a lot of times, a lot of that pushback that we got was just because people didn't want their world to change. They were very comfortable with the way that it is. So we had to help them manage that uncertainty. And last, accountability. Saying what we mean and mean what we say and making sure we're all consistently saying the same thing. It wasn't a blame game. We're not doing this because the fire department took all of our money or we're not doing this because the police department is getting new vehicles, but making sure that we had a community message. Last but not least, have we effectively cut through the noise? We don't know. That report is still being written. But I will tell you this, that we now have more engagement of our employees, of our uh, community members, than we ever had be before. If Jennifer was here, she could tell you that we have more applicants for our advisory boards than we ever had before. So we're still writing it, and we thank you for listening.